Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of The, the School Zone. Zone. So when we last left off, we had pretty much taken care of most of the courtyard, beyond the wall, all that stuff, and now we're about to enter Dr. Galvani's offices to complete her little side quest so we can get another rune. So let's take a look. All right, so while it's loading, I should tell you that this is going to be probably a longer episode than normal because we're going to try to cover all three floors in one single episode. So let's tackle it. Maybe in a clockwise direction. Staying organized and we'll head over here to our first book, Rat Behavior and Extermination. Excerpt from a series of interviews with street workers by rat catcher Lena. Used to be you'd go out with a bag, a stick with a nail in the end, and catch as many rats as you could in a night. The city watch paid by weight. My husband Benjamin and I mostly worked alone and we got by. If we found a place where the rats were real bad, sometimes we'd hire a crew of street brats to work with us, the younger ones who didn't make trouble. We'd pay them with bread and apple cider. Once the plague came, the rats were different. Meaner, bigger, and a little quicker. You had to watch yourself. If you got cornered, they'd turn and the swarm would come back at you. I barely got away with my skin a few times, down in the sewers. The bites hurt afterwards, but it was the sounds they made that stayed in your dreams at night. It got more dangerous and the city watch started paying better. But that didn't last long because after a while, too many people had been stripped clean trying to fill a bag. One slip and they'd be all over you, gnawing and trying to chew down to the bone. That's how I lost my poor Benji. Poor Benji. Let's see what this audiograph player has to say. Obviously, the plague rat is distinct from the ordinary rat. But in what respect? Its size and the coarseness of its fur, and I believe in intelligence, although the experiments there are not complete. Coriander's zoological survey describes only the ordinary rat, which means plague rats have only been here for five or seven years at most. This was not a gradual migration. Could they have been introduced on purpose? Perhaps by a foreign power. Coriander is uh, the name of a spice, but I think in this case it's the guy's name. And when he said zoological survey, zoological means having to do with zoology, which is the study of animals. And survey means an in-depth study on a topic, usually involving observation. So let's keep on heading around here. The Rat Plague. Excerpt from a Natural Philosopher's Notes. For over a year I studied this cursed plague, collecting and dissecting rats by the thousands. Given their rapid gestation, which is a shorter word for the development of a fetus until birth, and the maturation cycle, it's been possible to breed them for numerous generations. The rodents themselves seem immune to the plague, but they pass it readily between members of their own species, perhaps through mites. Mites are more like ticks than fleas, but all parasites have a chance of spreading disease because their mouth part, usually this feeding tube part called a proboscis, acts like a dirty used needle from one animal to the next. The bloods of the rats tell its own story, allowing me to gauge the number of generations that a given group of rats have lived with the plague. As such, a nagging question remains. The rats collected in the poorest parts of town in the slums exhibit the oldest strains of the plague, while those found near the docks, where the foreign plague-bearing rats would have presumably entered our city, exhibit a younger strain of the plague. Could this mean that the rats were transported to the slums in some way that is not obvious? I will continue my research. If nothing else, I am living proof that Sokolov's elixir and Piero's remedy are very effective at protecting against the plague if one consumes enough of the stuff. All right, so we are starting to get more clues that this was a act of bioterror. Let's take a quick peek and see if we're safe so we don't have to be sneaking around. Yeah, I think all the guards are downstairs. We're good to go. Let's uh let's see what we got here. So we have some lab equipment. Some various kinds. I don't need to carry any. These are test tubes, you probably know if you've 
been in a chemistry class, this right here is called a retort. Anybody who's played the Elder Scrolls Oblivion probably remembers that term. It's, uh, it's used for distilling liquids. So when it's heated, some of the water will evaporate and rise out into the controlled neck, leaving the original fluid a little more concentrated. I could, I could be wrong, but I think that's how it works. And this here is a microscope. And it's hard to say when microscopes were first invented, but most evidence points to Galileo in the 17th century. However, light microscopes weren't developed until right around when dishonor takes place, so that fits nicely. All right, there's a little coin. So we equip that bone charm to make that a little more quiet. So I don't think anybody downstairs hurt us. Let's uh, continue around. That's cool. You can just look at the uh, chalkboard and it'll add a clue. I think, let's check the clue. River crusts are vulnerable when they open their protective shell to spit acidic slime at prey. So that's an important fact we'll be demonstrating later. More about river crusts. I can't really read all those terms, so I'll, I'll skip the biology lesson there. Let's see here. Not sure what that's for. I'm going to do a little research and see if we need to take that. But you can only carry it, so instead of equip it. So it's probably just something you'd throw at uh, the guards. All right, this right here, not sure exactly what type of equipment this is. Could be like an old fashioned or an early version of a wash bottle, but if someone knows, leave a comment in the after school club. This right here is a Bunsen burner. I know that. Um, it was named after its inventor, Robert Bunsen, right around the middle of the 19th century. So, once again, fits perfectly in with Dishonored. A little gas flame lit allows things like test tubes or beakers to be heated in a controlled way. And if I remember from my old high school chemistry class, you can tell how open the valve is by the color of the flame. Neat little factoid there. And don't know what this thing is, actually. Um, definitely steampunk looking. Uh, could be a condenser attached to a barrette, but if we have any chemistry students or engineers watching, then uh, let me know if you might know exactly what that is. Okay, another bull rat fetus. Don't need to mess with that. Sounds kind of gross. Galvani Academy Notice. Let's check it out. Galvani, the latest case should arrive within a week, containing all the components you need. Be careful with the white phosphorus, which is a form of the element phosphorus, which can burn really hot and produce a lot of smoke. Can't have you getting fossy jaw like the tanners at the edge of the city, poor bastards. Interesting. Fossy jaw is actually a disease you can get from working with phosphorus usually making matches, in which the vapors will settle in your jaw bones and then eat away all your gums. So in real life, right around when dishonor takes place, there was a protest called the Match Girl Strike, where match workers, usually women who had lost all their teeth, finally had enough and forced the industry to change forever. Sorry to have you practice in secret, the vivisectionist should be celebrated. A vivisectionist is someone who specializes in cutting up bodies for anatomical study, it became a controversial word, though, because bodies weren't always dead when they were carved into. Gruesome. Revered, even. Cutting up rats should be done in the town square with a crowd of eager students taking notes, not in some dirty little secret room hidden behind a wall of books. Anyway, lucky for you to have an old friend who never left the academy. Let me know what else you need, but remember it might be a month before I can put together another shipment. Yours in knowledge, Artemis Moore, Procurement Clerk. A procurement clerk takes care of the purchase orders for a company, procure means to obtain, 
and provisioner. A provisioner is the purchaser of provisions, and provisions usually mean supplies. Academy of Natural Philosophy, South Wing. P.S. Next time you're nearby, come in for an afternoon. We've stayed fairly insulated from the plague. Insulated in this context means to be isolated away or protected. Since so few come and go here, and we've got quite the stock of Tivian brandy. I don't think we've covered what brandy is in a previous episode. So brandy is the alcohol from fruit, just as beer is the alcohol from grains, gin is the alcohol from juniper, and so on. So each uh, kind of type of plant produces uh, a different type of alcohol that, that's given sort of a, a brand name, so to speak. I suppose now is as good a time as any to mention that a, a Dr. Galvani existed in real life. He was an Italian scientist from the 18th century who first discovered animal electricity, also known as uh, bioelectricity, which later became known as galvanism. Supposedly, Luigi Galvani, along with his nephew Giovanni Aldini, were the real-life inspirations for Mary Shelley's character of Dr. Frankenstein. All right, let's head back through here and see what we got. Leviathan Sorrow. Okay, nothing else of importance. <laughs> They're newspapering the windows. Weird. Excerpt from a report on a treatise banned by the Rudshore Trade Council. Little is known of Bacati, credited with this series of pamphlets arguing against the whale trade. While he is gifted, his views are nonsense and threaten the economic underpinnings of the empire. Underpinning originated as a construction term involving the reinforcement of a building from below, but in this context he means the essential support of the economy. Number one, enslavement, on the breeding and husbanding of whales. And he's not talking about marrying the whales. In this context he's talking about animal husbandry, which is basically an old-fashioned word for farming, versus hunting the beasts in the wild after a natural and free life cycle. Bacati offers no solutions for where these massive malevolent, which means evil or harmful, creatures might be pastured. Pastured in this context means to secure and feed in a breeding area. I don't know exactly why he thinks whales are malevolent, but uh, if he's talking about when they get attacked uh, or their families get attacked, I'm sure whales will defend themselves and defend their families. It's uh, probably much like the castle law of the sea. Number two, dissolution. Dissolution in this context means to break up or unbind something. Laments on the destruction of social bonds between herd member. Picotti actually uses the term families. I'm going to put a little pop-up if I can uh, remember what uh, a pack of whales is called. It might be called a herd. I don't know. But if it's not, I'll put up a pop-up so uh, he can all be educated on that one. Number three, harmony. Drivel. Drivel means slobber, but in this context, he's meaning uh, talking nonsense. On the aesthetic wonder, aesthetic is like beauty, of what is, in reality, the great and terrible ocean that ever threatens to swallow us. Includes arguments of the gentle nature of the brutes, a notion refuted by seamen who return to the shore wide-eyed with tales of the whale savagery. And number four, disruption. Here, Picotti is on his weakest footing, issuing up feverish warnings, Feverish in this context means panicked or frenzied against the displacement or transference of natural beasts from their native environments. <laughs> sort of uh, a little bit of anti-propaganda, you could say. Yeah, so behind here is where we want to go. But before we do all that, let's uh, just check out the rest of this area. Whale physiology. We talked about physiology in a past episode. And then this number here, 287, looks bolded for some reason, which we'll get to later. Just felt like spinning that globe. And let's check this area out. All right, I don't think there's anything important in here, but 
I am curious as to why they use red lights like this in labs. I don't know if they do it very often. I've seen it in in uh, photo labs before, but um, I'm not sure why it would be all red in here. If anybody has an idea, let us know. I think it has something to do with either desensitizing your eyes from white light or may have to do with things not spoiling as quickly because there's less ultraviolet light. If anyone knows the answer, then definitely leave a comment in the After School Club. And let's see what we got over here. Come on now. There we go. Okay, we can't go through there just yet. Alright, so let's head on back over and open this secret door. Very Arthur Conan Doyle there. Okay, so this is what we want to pick up. Let's just uh, grab these coins. See what's in this cabinet. Ah, yes. Never can have too many of those. And then read sewer capacity in the month of nets. Excerpted interview attached to a formal report by City Works Crew 17A. I've been asked to tell the problem, so here it is. It's been every year that we work like men gone mad during the month of nets. I like how they name all the months in Dishonored after sort of what takes place in that month. So I've seen month of rain, month, you know, month of nets is probably like their harvesting season. I don't hardly see my family. It's bad enough that the works is clogged with trash and the catch, pieces of crates and nets, but the water smells of hagfish guts too. I imagine that's probably pretty gross. We got to get it done before the month of rain, or you know what. Yep, it'll flood out onto the streets. It ain't like we get help from those pricks in civil engineering, either. Been this job for nigh on 28 years. Nigh on is an old-fashioned way of saying nearly. And ne'er I see one of them come below. Ne'er is obviously uh, a contraction for never, but uh, it's not used very often. Except a measure when it will hold when they go putting up one of their fancy new bridges. So these last three years have been the worst, and here's why. It's the river crust, moved into the works. We hear a man ahead yell and scream like he's burning up, and we all climb up fast, no other choice. Okay, so we'll see some of those a little later on, and then let's grab our little objective here. Rat viscera. So viscera means the organs of the abdomen, so basically the guts. Okay, so we've uh, accomplished our main goal here, but there's a lot more to check out. So we are going to... Wait a second. There's got to be a key somewhere, like right there. Okay. Sweet. All right, let's just take a quick peek around. There's a blood ox head. I mentioned in a previous episode we'd see those mounted. That's what they look like. A couple of people down there. I don't want to bust this yet. Because it might alert them. So we'll wait on that. And we've already been behind there, so we don't need to go down there. But let's uh let's see. Oh, you know, one of the things I'm gonna do here is I'm going to save. Uh this is one of the things that uh I encourage all of you to do. Uh, I haven't been doing much of it because I'm only playing, you know, 20, 30 minute episodes at a time. But if you're playing sort of, sort of more marathon episodes, I would definitely suggest saving as often as possible. So I'm going to just hit the save button here. Okay, so we blow this whole deal. Okay, so now... Wait. Did you touch the door handle to Dr. Galvani's lab? Yeah, I think so. Then you have to scrub. The rats get their vital essences everywhere, the doctor said. Vital essences? Does that mean guts? 
Ha! Huh, so. He schooled that one. So your hands need scrubbing. You're unclean. Unclean? That's nonsense. Can't we just... No, I told you. With rubbing alcohol or white vinegar. All right, all right. What is he doing there all day? Ambrose says he breeds rats that carry the plague. Your friends are ignorant. The doctor is a brilliant man. If anyone can save this city, it's him. The royal physician is going to save us. Ayer's new elixir is twice as good against the plague. I don't understand how Galvani can admire Sokolov. Royal physician or not, I hear tell he's a beast. A superstitious philanderer who spends more time with prostitutes than he does in the laboratory. Is this what it's going to be like when we're married? It is, isn't it? I hope not. I'm telling you now, I don't have the endurance for it. <laughs> Happy couple. Okay. So, he's probably going to walk up here now. So we're going to do a little hiding. And she mentioned white vinegar. So white vinegar is basically concentrated or purified vinegar. Um, we know that alcohol can kill germs because that's basically uh, what's in those hand sanitizers. But white vinegar can also be used for sanitizing. But it smells bad, so that's why it's not used that often. And we're going to sleep dart this guy. Because he was about to see us. Alright, we'll set him right here for now. Go. Knock out his fiance. So she doesn't squeal on us. See if we can sneak around back here. We can. Great. Don't have to use another sleep dart. All we have to do is wait for her to turn around. Stop admiring the wall. All right, we're going to teleport behind her because uh, she's taking her sweet time. Okay, there's a safe. We'll come back to that. In the meantime, let's drop her somewhere comfortable. Like that chair there. And go see what we have going on on the second floor. Oh yeah, I'm going to go back up for these spring razors, I believe they were. Very nice. I left him alive just because he's uh, getting married. They don't get along. Fate probably worse than death. <laughs> Alright, so... Uh, here we have a few of those steampunk lab items again on display. So if anybody knows what those are, let me know. Travel to Pandicia. I'm not sure if we read this yet. Let me check it out. Excerpt from a travel chronicle by Anton Sokolov. The men I set out with are good sailors. No doubt half of them have cut their teeth on the rascally pirate ship spawned in the Circonian. I don't know why I keep saying Circonian. Sounds better on the tongue, you know what I mean? On the rascally pirate ship spawned in the Circonan Archipelago. Or they were, I should say. Half of them died before we sighted the broken red cliffs, welcoming those who would visit the far continent, as it is called. Sickness, infighting, poisoned by a school, or would one say a flock of small fish that fly over the waves like birds, landing in the hundreds across the deck, pricking anyone they touched with toxic quills. Two thrown overboard by gusting demon winds, the quiet Tivian navigator simply dead in his bunk, wrapped in his white furs, eyes wide with terror. Few have crossed the ocean, and the distance to Pandicia is greater than most would imagine. 
more dead climbing the cliffs. And now, with but a handful, I stand looking across the greatest expanse of land that exists. My allies are frightened, for this is beyond them, and now their captain is dead too, stung by something that resembled a prairie mole but reacted with a great apoplectic outrage when handled. So it falls on me to lead them. All right. You're making progress. I wonder why the plate in the Hound Pits pub was loot, but th that one isn't. Don't know. <laughs> She's just chilling. Okay. We are good. Canker Mouth Gulf Map. Once again, pretty much looks the same. Looks like a little lounge. <laughs> Funny that this counted as a TV back in the day. <laughs> they just stare at a painting and chat. But, you know, I guess that's kind of cool sometimes. All right, let's keep moving. Okay, so this here is a pendulum clock. Back up so you can see a little bit better. There we go. It was first invented in the 1600s. Um, but in the 1900s, large pendulum clocks like this were seen as a status symbol of the wealthy. Also, I, I could be wrong, but I think the main difference between a pendulum clock and a grandfather clock is that the mechanisms inside a grandfather clock are basically hidden from view inside an ornate wooden cabinet. So, clockwork, definitely. Steampunk. A little bedroom area here. Ooh, we're maxed out, which means I can use one and take that one. Some sleep darts to recover what we just used. Dr. Galvani's journal. I've been invited to a soiree at the Boyle Estate. A soiree is like a fancy word for a highfalutin party. Of course, I wouldn't attend. The 28th day of the 7th month, the month of high coal, is the day I met Anton Sokolov at the academy. Why would I tarnish the anniversary of the most important day of my life by licking aristocratic boots? Aristocratic means, like, of royalty. I have no time for fools. I will be solving the riddle of this plague. Perhaps I'll raise a cup of tivy and red. Wine. He's talking about, I presume? All right, so that's probably his master bedroom there. Let's keep moving. And we got a couple of guards. Let's see if we can sneak in here. All right, so we are going to check this out. Beating log. Fourth day, month of wind, assorted human remains, strong appetite. Tenth day, month of wind, one bag, tibian pears, bruised, rotted, rats uninterested. Eleventh day, month of wind, one tin, potted whale meat, eaten. Thirteenth day, month of wind, human torso, no trouble finding corpse parts. Seventeenth day, month of wind, no feeding, aggression increased, incident of cannibalism. Twentieth day, month of wind, incident with previous maidservant, will withhold feeding until first day, month of darkness. Alright, so these are some hungry rats. Grab these keys and then we are going to release them upon these guards, just for the fun of it. Should take at least one of them out. Let's 
All right, so we got one of them, which means that we can sneak up on this guy. Awesome. Gotcha. Ash. Sweet. Ash. Nice. Alright, we are doing good. I think that's all of them. So now we can just walk around unfettered. Oh no, did not just do that. Okay, I guess that was on the feeding tray and I just slid right through that. Nothing in here. Can you top that off? Medicinal herbs. Oh look, some grapes. Better than that canned meat. Oh no, that doesn't look so good. In fact, let's read about the food of Morley. Excerpt from a traveler's journal. Born and raised in Gristol, I spent my formative years, which means a child's developmental stages, but can also mean adolescence, in our smaller cities before settling in magnificent Dunwall. There, in the capital city, I learned to appreciate the finer things. When the opportunity arose to document my travels to Circonos, Tivia, and finally Morley, I left my position as a clerk for the late Lord Estermont. Perhaps, like so many in Dunwall, I suffer from being excessively cultured, but I found Morley disappointing. Over the course of this journal, I will explain why I found the Festival of Churners to be tiresome. A churner in this context is someone who used to use their feet to mash or mix stuff like butter or grapes for wine, despite the high banners, bare feet, and red robes, and why their renowned jellied ox tongue is something I will be struggling to forget for many years to come. All right, let's keep moving on. Let's take a peek out here. A couple things we can grab here. So there's not enough of these rats to harm us. That's why they're not swarming. A couple of bolts. Avoiding the rat plague. Excerpt from a Government Protocol on Disease Practices Much of the public still harbors false beliefs related to the plague. It is not true that bile from river crust will protect against contraction of the disease. Bile is the dark fluid produced by the liver to help with digestion. Nor is it true that crushed Morley orchids act as a remedy, though it is speculated that both of these ingredients are used in both Sokolov's elixir and Piero's remedy. Consumption of these products before exposure to the plague constitutes the only known means of resisting the disease. Further, the Abbey of the Eberman warns against superstitious practices. Not only is it ineffective to burn two hagfish and a cat together, inhaling vapors while chanting the names of the plague dead, but it is also considered heresy, which means a belief that goes against the church, by the overseers and will be met with the full measure of the Abbey's laws. Tell your neighbor and practice these things yourself. Avoid contact with the infected, consume your ration of elixir daily, preferably in the morning, and report anyone suspected of carrying the plague. Everyone must work together to stop the spread of the dreaded contagion, which means the spreading of a disease. All right, interesting stuff. Let's keep moving. The third stricture. Excerpt from a work detailing one of the seven strictures. Restrict the restless hands, which quickly become the workmates of the outsider. Unfettered by honest labor, they rush to sordid gain. Sordid means dirty or immoral. Vain pursuits and deeds of violence. Of what value are the hands that steal and kill and destroy? Instead, put your hands to the plow, the fork, and the spade. For even the lowliest labor that is rigorous squeezes the muscles as a sponge, rinsing impurities from the mind and body. 
Those uh, overseers are zealots, aren't they? Couple of bolts. Okay, I think we've uh, covered it all. Nice. Didn't get discovered, didn't need to use our resave. So we are gonna head back up to the second floor and open this safe. Okay, so if you remember upstairs when we were looking at as an actual lab, we saw the number 287 written on that chalkboard. So I'm gonna take a very educated guess and say that's what the combination is. It's probably listed in one of the books somewhere too, but we got time for all that. And yes, sir. A couple of ingots worth a hundred each. Nice. That'll cover that uh, lens magnification. All right. When we pick up next time, we're going to head down to Slackjaw's little bootleg joint and poison his uh, elixirs. So thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you in the next episode.